What's up, guys? I pray you're blessed and that you guys are standing strong in your faith. That's exactly what this channel is all about, to help you guys with wise thinking and bold living. So today, we're going to be answering the question, why do Catholics pray to Mary? Why do they pray to the saints? I'm going to start off, I'm going to show you guys a video by Michael Knowles. And Michael Knowles is a Catholic, and he's on the Daily Wire. And I agree with a ton of things that my Catholic friends believe. Let me just get that out of the way. But I'm going to respond as a Protestant in areas of theology and our interpretation of Scripture so that you can better you know, engage your Catholic friends. And I think there's a lot of things we have in common, and there's just some things that we disagree. So let's start with Michael to see what he has to say. Why do you pray to anyone at all other than God? I say, do you ever pray for people? I say, well, sure. I say, do you ever ask other people for prayers? What does it mean to pray? To pray is to ask. That's what mm -hmm. the word means. Uh, if you pray to, if you say, hey, Bob is really sick. My husband, Bob, is really sick. He's in the hospital. Can you pray for him? Right. Well, then you are praying that someone pray for you. You're doing exactly the same thing. They say, well, that's fine. I'm, I'm doing that to living people. Not, well, I'm doing that to living people too. I'm doing that to Mary and I'm doing that to the saints. The definition of a saint is someone who is alive. Who, is, who, is, who, is, who has eternal life. As a matter of fact, the saints are the only people that we know for sure are alive at all. And, and then you say, well, where do you see it in Scripture? And there are a great many things that, that we know to be true that are not in Scripture. The word Trinity never appears in Scripture, and yet we know the triune God. But you see it in Revelation, which is that uh, the saints in heaven are holding their pots full of the prayers of the saints. Who on earth would the saints be praying for? They're not praying for the other saints. They're all doing very well. They're, they're praying for us. They're praying for us, and we can pray to them. I think this is a, a one area that is uh, pretty confused, and I have great sympathy. I understand why people are confused by it. Why do you pray? Okay. Well, so let me just start with this. Okay, In Catholic theology, Latria is specifically directed to the Holy Trinity. So there is a form of worship that is only directed to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's representing a worship that acknowledges God's supreme sovereignty, His majesty, His divinity. So let's just understand that that's what Catholics, at the heart of their theology, they believe in. And so they're using, the, again, going back to the Catholic Church, they're using some of the Latin phrases when it comes to worship. I agree with that. So Protestants agree with that. And so Catholics distinguish between Latria and other forms of veneration. And you could go back to these different forms, Dulia and Hyperdulia, that stem from the Second Council of Nicaea. This is back in 787 AD. Now, Dulia refers to the veneration given to saints. It recognizes their holiness and their virtuous lives and involves asking for their intercession and involves looking up to them as models of Christian living. So right off the bat, notice, Agree with you when it comes to Latria, when it comes to worshiping God, the triune Godhead. But Dulea, coming from the Second Council of Nicaea, this is where we start to differ. This is when you start having these councils and start parsing things out in certain practices in Christian living. And in this case, when it comes to prayer and then Hyperdulia, this is a special veneration that's given specifically to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it acknowledges her as this unique individual, this un that she plays a unique role as Mother God, right? Uh, the Mother of Jesus Christ. And she's the most exalted of all the saints. So no notice that in the Catholic faith, you do start over time, have this um, veneration for levels, if you will, of sainthood. So she's the most exalted of all because she's the Mother of God. But it, it's still distinct from Latria. Okay, so I, I want us to understand that when it comes to proper worship, proper theology, when we look at worship, a, a, a common practice of a Catholic and their belief with a Protestant is Matthew 4, 10. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So Michael Knowles there and a couple other Catholics that I'm going to be showing you in a minute, we agree with that. Matter of fact, we also agree in Revelation 19, verse 10, when John the Apostle attempts to worship an angel, the angel rebukes him saying, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And then he says, worship God. So Catholics and Protestants agree with that. So that's important, my friends. 
Now, to speak more specifically, when you start getting into this area, that's also known as Eucharistic adoration. This is considered latria because it involves spending time in prayer before the blessed sacrament. And this is where you start getting some differences of, of where Protestants and Catholics say, okay, you know, the blessed sacrament is Catholics. They're believing in the true presence of Christ there. So they would say when they're taking the Eucharist, that that is latria, that is actual worship to God because the elements are, in fact, the body of Jesus. That's, again, where we would differ now, okay? So when you get into the communion of the saints, we agree as Catholics and Protestants of the concept of the communion of saints as a whole, but when you start going into particulars, this is where, again, we start going two different directions. Now, on the common approach, we share belief with Catholics that yes, we as believers are connected to the universal body of Christ. And that encompasses both the past as well as the present. And of course the future, whatever believers in Christ come after us. And you see this picture in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, where it says, therefore, since we are what surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So in that sense, a Catholic and a Protestant, more or less, okay, on a more generalistic level of interpretation, we would say that the saints in heaven, yes, are alive. They're more alive than we are, okay? They just don't have their bodies right now. They're resurrected bodies. Neither do we. We're in this body of decay. And so we, we would say that they are aware of things here on earth. Now, the question is, because they know what's happening in this world, what involvement do they then have? So what I want to do is I want you guys to hear one of the arguments that's used by the Catholics as to why they offer uh, or send requests to Mary. And I want you guys to see that some of these things that they teach are in fact not grounded in the word of God. But I think before we dive into that, I think it's important to point out with our Catholic friends that, yes, I agree with you that when we ask for prayer to saints here on earth, that's not the same as, as praying to the saints in heaven. And that's not diminishing, okay, the lives that they lived. Uh, that is not saying that the dead in Christ, just because they have passed away and they're in heaven, doesn't mean that they're just, that's it, just dead or like soul sleep or anything like that. No, I think they are more alive than we are, okay? So they kind of use us sometime, sometimes to kind of get Protestants, you know, off kilter a little bit. But I don't see the, the hom homogeneity or the equivalency uh, of asking saints like on earth for prayer, like you saw Michael saying as an example, and uh, applying that as well to saints in heaven. And then he says, oh, well, where's that in scripture? We're going to get to the book of Revelation in a minute. But we do not see that specifically. And here's why. When you actually see repeatedly throughout Scripture, when we are to ask our brothers and sisters who are alive on earth to pray for us, just because we're not in heaven doesn't diminish our prayers. We see in Romans 15, Paul the Apostle was appealing to his brethren by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, by the love of the spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Okay. So we see that and you see that something that's going to be acceptable to the saints. He's talking about the holy ones sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ on earth. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So we see that throughout scripture of when we do pray for one another, it never says Pray to the people who are dead in Christ who've gone after you, okay? And notice you're asking people on earth to pray based on what we see in Scripture. And because of time, I'm only giving you two examples, but it's throughout. But nowhere do we see in Scripture sending our prayers to those who are dead in Christ, that who the people that are in heaven. doesn't ever give you that mandate. Now, Catholics' only real argument, okay, and this is still a stretch, and the biblical text comes from several passages in the book of Revelation. Michael alluded to it. And it mentions the prayers of the saints. Now, by the way, Catholics will use 2 Maccabees 15 and Tobit 12 as biblical text to defend their position. 
but but seeing that as Protestants, we don't view those as you know inspirational books. They may be historical documents, but they're not divinely inspired. I'm not going to focus on those because we're only strictly looking at the pure argument of where do we find that in the Holy Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. Now, I want to go back and I want to show you guys another video, and this is from Pints of Aquinas, and listen to what he says about why they pray to saints as Catholics. Third thing to keep in mind is that the saints in heaven are aware of the saints on earth. We could look at a number of different passages. We could look in the Old Testament. We could look in the Gospels. We could look in the Epistles, and we can look in the Book of Revelation. We can even look at what sort of Jews of Christ's day uh, thought of these things. So, first of all, two, you know, up till the 16th century, Protestants and Catholics had the same Bible. Even Luther's first German translation of the Bible contained the Deuterocanonical books. Uh, one of the reasons Luther was keen to get rid of them is that they did teach things that he wanted to contest. Uh, so Second Maccabees and Tobit, which Protestants don't have in their Bible, though I think they should, um, gives, I think, a good example of, of this. Okay, so in Second Maccabees 1511, Judas Maccabeus has a dream which the Bible says is, quote, worthy of belief, and it depicts the deceased high priest Onias and the prophet Jeremiah, quote, praying with outstretched hands for the whole body of the Jews. In Tobit, uh, we read that the angel uh, Raphael is praying for Tobit. He says, Tobit, when you and Sarah prayed to the Lord, I was the one who brought your prayers into his glorious presence. Now, as I say, I understand that Protestants don't view these books as canonical, and so therefore they may not you know, help a great deal, except to show that the Jews of this time did understand that the saints in heaven and the angels can pray for us. In fact, the Talmud also describes the practice of visiting the graves of deceased loved ones to invoke their prayers and, and intercession. So, you know, it's important to realize that if you want to deny what Catholics teach about intercession to the saints, you, one option that's not really available to you is this was some medieval invention that the church invented for some such, right? This, this, uh, this is very ancient. Now, we can look at Matthew 17 as well. Um, if we are not meant to be conversing with the saints in heaven, uh, why would Christ set the example of him communing with both Moses and Elijah? Okay. So there's a lot, and I encourage you guys, I'll put the links in the description below about those kind of things. Um, but let, let's kind of dive in a little bit because I, I like what pints of with Aquinas, the guy there, I like what he says in a lot of cases. Again, this is not completely rejecting everything that they hold to. But let's look at the text, shall we? In Revelation 5, verse 8, it says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, so these are angels, and the 24 elders, okay, so these are human beings, these are holy saints. We don't know much other than they have referenced throughout the book of Revelation. And we're told that they fell down before the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ, and we're told that each holding a harp, okay, so if you have four living creatures and 24 elders, in essence, you have four angels, 24 human beings all in heaven, each one of them holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, Matthew 17, let's back up a little bit. Nowhere does it say that Jesus was praying to Moses or Elijah or that Moses and Elijah in the Mount of Transfiguration that were there with the inner circle. And even Peter himself says, hey, let's build some tabernacles. Let's, let's hang out with these guys thinking like Jesus is about to rule and reign completely misses it, right? That's not even the focus. So it's not a good text to use uh, to say that this is a, a symbol or an example that we can testify to of praying to the saints. Let's look at Revelation 6, 9 through 10. It says, when he opened this, the, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So notice these are martyrs who have been killed for their faith. And we're told in Revelation 6, verse 10, they cried out with a loud voice, so who are they crying out to? O sovereign Lord. Okay. So when they are crying out, yes, notice that they are slain for the word of God and they are praying holy and true. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood? Okay. So they're crying out to the Lord on their behalf, on those who dwell on the earth. Now, the phraseology that they're saying here is notice they're saying, Oh, see, these people who've died and now in heaven, they're praying for people on earth. Even if that's the case, 
we don't see scripture telling the people on earth to pray for the dead and Christ in heaven. Let's pause and let's look at the next passage in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar with golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Now notice, what is it saying here in Revelation 8? Another angel came, not dead in Christ, not holy saints, not the 24 elders, whoever they might be. We more than, Most New Testament scholars believe them to be, again, as I said, holy saints, people who have died, who are now in the presence of God. Now, Catholics are so determined to pull together these verses, as I mentioned in Revelation chapter um, 6, chapter 8, and of course in chapter 5, verse 8. They're so determined to put together these verses in Revelation as endorsements, if you will, of prayers to the saints that I do believe, and all due respect to my Catholic friends, that they overlook actually the text. Because the text is about Jesus's judgment in the last days. If you go back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, the martyrs are seen as calling to God for his judgment on those who killed them. And in chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, the prayers of the saints are immediately connected with the trumpets of God's judgment. So these prayers then are evidently for God's vindication of the martyred saints. And in verse 10, it refers to the coming judgment. So it may be that the prayers are petitions for God to judge the world and to extend his kingdom throughout the earth. Now let's go and let's see another ind individual and it's Trent Horn. And he's, he's, on with a Protestant gal uh, who's on the blaze and listen to what he says when they're debating about this whole thing about praying to saints. If What's funny is if that is what prayer is, then asking Mary to pray for us, that actually wouldn't count as prayer because I'm not directing that request to God, I'm requesting it to another creature. So what's the when you pray the rosary, what is that? When you pray the rosary? Yes. Well, pr I would say what prayer is, Prayer is just a request. So okay. in the mo we've restricted okay. the word prayer in a modern sense to mean exclusively yeah. making a request of God. But traditionally the word the word prayer comes Jeez. from the Latin word precare. Like pray tell. Pray yes. yes. If you've listened to all kinds of pride and prejudice. <laughs> yeah. I, I pray thee tell. Pray this. Right. Uh so prayer to the saints, that, that would just fall under I ask. Okay, there's so much more, uh, and again, I encourage you guys to check out the videos that I put in the description. Now, let's just break this down then. Notice he says, but traditionally, you know, pray tell, procore. Well, let's look at the text they're using, and so does Trent. They use the book of Revelation, so let's keep to the text. Prayers, the prayers here, the prayers of the saints, what we see in Greek is to speak to or to make requests of God. Okay, so it is a request. Notice it's to God. It means to pray, to speak to God, to ask God for prayer, for justice, for whatever it may be, okay? So prayer here is proskue from pros, which means toward or immediately before, and echome means to pray or to make a vow. And it's more the, the more general sense for prayer here in the book of Revelation, and this is even throughout Scripture, okay, is used only for prayer to God. Now, let me take it a step further, because notice consistently in these passages in the book of Revelation, in the tribulational, the, the tribulational period of time, which is marked out for seven years according to De, uh, De, uh, Daniel chapter 9, there is an imagery of prayer that John sees with these bowls and these incense of prayers. And this is actually imagery that we see that's depicted in Psalm chapter 141, verse 2, where David says, let my prayer be counted as incense before you. In the lifting up of my hands, notice as the evening sacrifice. Now, prayer is being compared to sacrifices. And guess what? If we see the context of the word prayer in Greek, I don't care what the tradition of what Trent was saying, because in the Greek and context, prayer is a vow. It's a request to God directly. And then you're seeing this incense, this, these bowls, 
that are like evening and morning sacrifices that are only offered to who? To God directly. Not through a third party, that is to say, heavenly saints. In Revelation 5 verse 8, it does not say that the bowl of prayers was offered to the 24 elders and the four living creatures. In Revelation chapter 4, 6 through 8, we actually are told previously before chapter 5, obviously, that the four living creatures are described with six wings and full of eyes. So most New Testament scholars believe that the description of these um, creatures that John describes are angels, or more specifically, the cherubim. So then when you jump to chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, we see that the prayers of the saints, which are future martyrs, right? They're crying out for justice and relief, are immediately connected with the trumpets of God's judgment. And so in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, the angel offers the incense on the coals before God. So nothing about the saints in heaven doing anything about receiving, interceding, or answering the prayers. In fact, according to their own interpretation of the text, Okay, if you're if you follow me here with the Catholic, their own interpretation of the text, why then should we just limit our prayers to the saints, these 24 elders that we don't know who exactly they are? And they're thinking that we're praying, they're holding the prayers as a sign that they interpret as because we're praying to them so they can offer to God. That's reading into the text. But if they want to read that like that, then why don't you go to the point of saying, let's pray to angels? Because I told you, when you see here in Revelation, throughout, specifically in chapter 8, it's an angel, not the saints in heaven, who offers the prayers of all the saints as a smoke of incense before God, before the throne of God. So the activity and the role that is being conducted by the angel is a priestly one, not the 24 elders. We see this throughout the book of Revelation, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 7. This is reflected, my friends, of the Aaronic priests that were offering incense in the tabernacle every morning and every evening. And that is what we're seeing here, even in the end times in the book of Revelation. The prayers are to God for God's vindication. These are special future prayers that we actually get a glimpse of seeing through John's revelation during the tribulation period. So it's not exactly what I would consider a strong endorsement for the practice of praying to the saints. So as I close, let me now focus in on six quick theological problems to this doctrine of praying to the saints by the Catholic Church. Number one, as I said, interpreting the prayers of the saints as being offered to heavenly saints is reading into the text. It's not explicitly stated. Number two, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 7 through 20, many people like to use Saul summoning Samuel. But if you look into that, what did Saul do? Number one, Saul wasn't a believer. Two, he sought the assistance of a witch of, of Endor. That was a practice that was banned. That's why he did it secretly in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Even the witch of Endor didn't want to do it because she knew that it was against the law. That is necromancy. That is not prayer. Not all Catholics use that as an argument, but some of them do. Number three, in the Gospels, we never once read from Jesus to pray to saints in heaven. What we actually see is him saying, our Father who art in heaven. Paul, John, James, Peter, Jude, the writer of Hebrews, none of them ask for the assistance of saints who have gone before them in heaven. So when you and I look at this type of veneration that is within the Catholic Church, it's a slippery slope. It's dangerous, my friends, because what we have to ensure is that we are not looking to saints in heaven for guidance. And this idea that they're acts because they have, you know, direct access to God because they're in heaven, we have direct access as well. But that doesn't make their prayers more potent. It doesn't give their prayers more efficacy because they're in heaven and we're not. Nowhere in scripture does it teach that. I believe that that assumption on the part of the Catholic, and this is what I believe personally, I do think it undercuts praying in the spirit. And this is where the traditionalism of Catholicism can really muddy things to my Catholic friends. So when you look at the second edition of the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, it makes clear this, this very thing, that you can actually pray to Mary. This is what the Catechism says, the second edition. Quote, when we pray to Mary, 
we are adhering with her to the plan of the Father, who sends his Son to save all men. Like the beloved disciple, we welcome Jesus' mother into our homes, for she has become the mother of all the living. We can pray with her and to her. There's other uh, prayers that you see throughout the Catholic Church where they refer to her as Our Protection, capital P, and of course, Our Mother, capital M. Others refer to her as Queen, and even they go so far as referring to her as the Most Gracious Advocate. My friends, this is now where, again, I told you earlier, this is slippery slope, so that not all Catholics may go this far, but the heart of the Catholic doctrine, the catechism, what we see is when you start putting Mary at a level that she herself, when you look at her prayer, her holy prayer in Luke chapter two, did not convey, nor did John who took care of her after Jesus ascended to heaven. What we actually see in closing is Jesus is our mediator, my friends, First Timothy 2 verse 5. We're told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he's our advocator. I love what Hebrews 7, 25 tells us that Jesus himself intercedes for us. See, that's being consistent to what we see in scripture, isn't it? In Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, we, I said earlier in Ephesians 6, 18, we are to pray in the spirit. And we're also told that even when we struggle in what to pray for, the Holy Spirit is praying for us. Not a holy saint who's gone before us. Praise God. We'll be reunited with them one day, but we don't pray to them so they they can offer their prayers and intercession to God. Again, nothing about saints in heaven interceding for us or earthly saints offering prayers to them that is found in scripture and something I believe that we should be doing. So my friends, I appreciate you guys staying all the way through to watch this. I know it's a little bit longer than normal, but I think it's so important to show respect to our Catholic friends. I do believe there are a lot of Catholics who genuinely know Christ as Lord and Savior. I think they're misguided in their doctrine in some areas. I pray for all of us that we won't be misguided in our interpretation of Scripture, but that we can rightly handle the Word of Truth. But when it comes to prayer, we do ask for prayer to people who are in our sphere, in our life, but we do not seek the help of people who've died and who are in heaven. They may know about things that are going on in this world, but that doesn't give us reason because we don't see it in scripture. We, it gives us reason actually to have more faith in our time to pray according to God's will, knowing that he hears us. So I love you guys. Until next time, keep standing strong in your faith. Mm-hmm.